and it's preaching time. Amen. It is preaching time. Amen. The Bible declares that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our preacher for this morning will be none other than the baby boy of the family, Reverend Dantrell Robinson. Eternal God, our Father, I come to you thanking you for yet another beautiful day on your earth. You are a beautiful, awesome, magnificent God, and I just love you for being you. If you don't do anything else, I just give thanks for this, who you are, Lord. At this time, please empty me out. Let me be an empty vessel so that the word that you have for your people can go forth and change their lives. Lord, we ask that you just touch everyone in the sound of my voice. Touch us in a mighty way, Father. We thank you. We love you. And we trust you. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Giving honor to God, who is the head of my life, and to my pastor in his absence, to my brothers in the ministry, my big brother here. I like being called the baby boy as as I approach this 40th birthday coming up. But I, I am new to ministry. This is about 18 months into giving the word of God from this sacred desk. And it is indeed a, a privilege that I have a pastor that allows us to have hands-on training, if you will. <laughs> um, to my parents who are here, it is a blessing, like I said, to be almost 40. to have your mother and your father together in the house of God with us this morning. Amen along with my baby, and I ask that you, before we start, that you um, please give prayer and traveling mercies, because my oldest son will be going off to college this time next week. I'll be in California driving him to the University of California, Davis, near Sacramento, so we definitely need your traveling mercies as we go across those mountains. Amen? Amen. So there is a word from the Lord. Will you please stand with me if you if you can, and turn with me to Mark, Matthew, sorry, Matthew, 14th chapter, 24th through the 32nd verse. This is what some would call an oldie but goodie, but the funny thing about this passage is that I had a, I had a sermon, I just told God, oh, this is going to be the one right here, Lord, I can just be used in this way, and he said, no, do this one, and this is the second time he's done that to me. And I'm just obedient to him because pastor tells me if you don't, you know, things don't be good for you after that. So Matthew, the 14th chapter and the 24th verse, reading from the New King James Version, it reads, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to the water. And so Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. I'm going to spend just a little time this morning preaching from the subject, where are you when he is walking? Y'all praying? Because I sure need it. In this country, each generation has an artistic voice that expresses their view of the world. That voice is made up of a chosen few 
who emerge and, and amplify that voice to the world. From Nat King Cole to Ray Charles, to James Brown, to Marvin Gaye, to Aretha Franklin, to Stevie Wonder, to Michael Jackson. Coming to the 80s, you have KRS-One, Public Enemy. Going to the 90s, you have a tribe called Quest. You got Tupac. You got Biggie. You got Jay-Z. You got Common. And now the kids like to listen to Kanye. But I'm here to tell you, there's another voice of young America right now that seems to rest on the shoulders of a brother named K.L. Duckworth. K.L. Duckworth was a likable, straight-A student. He never thought he'd live past the age of 25 because of his violent and unstable environment. Gang violence, drugs, come on y'all, don't that sound familiar? Police brutality, hopeless mentalities throughout the world, surrounded K.L. Duckworth all his life. One would call his constant obstacles and struggles a storm. But despite the challenges, threats, and temptations on his journey, K.L. Duckworth, the young people call him Kendrick Lamar, has become a strong artistic voice for his generation. And now that he is on the top of the world, so to speak, in classic fashion, those who spoke failure into his life, those who told him he would never see 25, those who spoke demise to this young man, now want to latch on to his success. And in his latest musical offering, he asks a very, very important question. I know the young people know the question. Where were you when I was walking? Walking. 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 So now let's put it on Bible ground. When translated, the Greek word for walk means peripateo meaning to make progress. You take it to the Hebrew translation, mahalak, simply means to live. So to walk is to make progress. To walk is to simply live. Walking is simply how we conduct ourselves. So repeat after me. Walking is how we conduct ourselves. Saints, it can be hard to make progress in this world. Sometimes it's a struggle to simply live and conduct ourselves in a way that creates peace and is pleasing to God. Not for lack of desire, but I believe one of the main reasons that keeps us from living and creating that peace and pleasing to God is the storms. Now, storms are defined as violent disturbances in the atmosphere. You want to live right, but, but there are undeniable disturbances in your environment. You woke up with the intention of your day being holy, but somebody, some, somebody or something called you or texted you first thing in the morning with some mess. And now you done cussed them out. You got up this morning with the expectation to move mightily in Jesus' name, but your body is full of pain. And the pills aren't working fast enough. So if storms represent violent disturbances and distractions in our lives, and, and walking symbolizes our life's progression, saints, it's safe to say that storms are constantly moving up and all through your walk. But God, he is with us through every stage of our walk. But the question I want to, you to ask yourself, you don't have to touch a neighbor, ask this within yourself. Where are you when he is walking? As we take a look at our text, the disciples are battling a storm when Jesus comes towards them in the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch. Walking on the water. The disciples lose it. They don't know it's Jesus right offhand. And they've been up all night trying not to sink and drown in this storm. And, and now, now they're freaking out big time because they see what they think is a ghost 
walking on the water. How many of you know that the fourth watch is the darkest watch leading into the morning? The fourth watch is around 3 a.m. The fourth watch is between the hours of 3 a.m. and 7 p.m. 7 a.m., sorry. So from 3 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock in the morning is the darkest time. Watch this. The disciples have been tussling with the storm all night. And Jesus shows himself. And Peter, and I like Peter. because Peter, Peter kind of, he kind of. He'll fight. He ain't, he, ain't, he ain't no shame in his game. But Peter says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, if it's you for real, for real, then let me know it's all right to come out there towards you. And watch this. Jesus tells Peter, come. One word. Just come. Peter hears Jesus, leaves the boat, and walks on the water towards his Savior. The storm's still raging, y'all. But Peter's faith was activated when he heard. When he heard Jesus' instructions. You have to hear the word of God. We just heard that. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans 10 and 17. You have to hear the word of God in order to grow your faith and confidence To the point where you will step out on faith and walk on water. But don't get it twisted. Mm. The focus isn't about Peter walking on the water. The focus isn't even about Jesus walking on the water. The point of this moment is that Peter wanted to be closer to Jesus. Jesus was on the water. Peter couldn't get that closeness on the boat. Peter wanted to be as close to Jesus as possible in the midst of the storm. So if you're walking by faith, then you automatically have a desire to get as close to Jesus as possible. Therefore, you should have a desire to make some changes in your life. Let's talk a minute about these boat people. You see, you can't stay on the boat and get close to Jesus. The boat represents the world. You can't listen to the people on the boat, a.k.a. the people of the world, and get close to Jesus. You can't increase your faith because boat people, quite honestly, like being on the boat. They like being in their comfort zone. They don't want to get close to God. And more importantly, they don't want you to get close to God. So you got to be careful about the boat people. Be in the world, but not of the world. So you really want to know why Peter went out there? Why did he walk on water? He just wanted to get close to God. He was willing to step out on faith and do the impossible, defies the laws of gravity, just to get to his Savior. How many of us desire God that much? How many of us truly want God that bad that we are willing to walk and do the impossible to get to him in your faith in him. You must step out on faith and walk on water through your storm to get closer to you. And my Bible tells me that if you move closer to him, he will move closer to you. So in this text, we see Peter in three places. While Jesus walked on the sea. Even as Jesus walked through our lives with protection, with love, with joy, with peace and comfort, we often find ourselves in one of three places. Three places while he continues to walk in our lives. The first place is a place of fear. Now, the disciples were surrounded by the storm, and the winds distracted them, and they didn't have the confidence to know that Jesus wouldn't let them perish. But Peter called out to Jesus, and when Jesus told him to come, he didn't hesitate. The world is a scary place, especially in present day. 
If you don't focus on Jesus, the winds of uncertainty and worry and negativity will consume you. It will. If you don't meditate on his word, spend time with him in prayer, and deliberately recall the times that Jesus has saved you in the past. He stepped in and worked miracles to this point. If you don't do that, the world will build a wall of fear that will create a barrier between you and God. And what happens then is that it blocks your future blessings. I'm a black man living in Birmingham, Alabama. Just this year alone, saints, I represent 6% of the country's population, but yet I make up a third of those who were killed by police this year. I make up half of all homicides committed this year. I live in the so-called eighth most dangerous city in the United States as of this year. That is what's happening in the world. That is what's happening inside the boat. If I stayed in the boat, I'd live in fear of those statistics. You must get out of the boat. Jesus keeps us every day. He spared our lives for us to be together in this moment right now. He came here so that I could live a life more abundantly, not to live in fear. Saints, you can't stay in fear and get closer to God. It's impossible. It's like two magnetic fields. You can't be fearful and get close to God because he's got you. I know what the statistics say, but he got you. And subsequently, I gave you the statistics on men, but women, there have been over nine homicides of black women this year. It's fearful. It's stormy. It's crazy. But God, he's walking with us. So you don't have to be in fear. So although that's where Peter was at first, look where he goes second. The second place he is while Jesus is walking is a place of faith. In Matthew 14 and 30, it says, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, we always think of Peter as sinking in the passage. We always talk about Peter was sinking when he went to Jesus. But we must remember that Peter did walk on the water successfully. Let's look at it from the beginning. He walked on the water successfully. He sank. Jesus picked him up, and then he walked some more on the water to the boat because of his faith and because of the word of God. Literally, the word. All Jesus said to him was come. He didn't preach a sermon. He didn't beg Peter to come out there. He didn't perform some more miracles. Let me multiply some more bread. Let me make some more fish. Let me turn some more water into wine. Let me give you some more proof. He told Peter, come. That's it. You know what I've done. You've been walking with me this whole time. You know what I'm capable of. All you got to do is just come. And Peter, on the strength of the word of God, walked on that water. Saints, this is where we need to be. Of the three places, this is the place you need to be. Because Jesus walks with us and we can always stand on the word of God. Because whatever God said will hold up. Whatever God said will build us up. Whatever God said cannot change. That's why we need to stop sitting on the boat and start standing on the promises of God. You can put your faith there and walk on the same waters and through those same storms that threaten your existence. So as I look at the statistics and I look at the world and I look at everything that's happening in the world today, I can stand on the promises of God and walk in faith. Which leads me to the third place that Peter was and where we often find ourselves while Jesus is walking through our lives. The third place is a place we visit a lot. We talked about being scared. We talked about being in complete faith, but there's that middle part, doubt. 
The scripture says, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Now, Peter, you just asked God. You just asked him. Let me go out here with you. God, Jesus said, come, and he walked on the water. And isn't that like us? We come to church. We get the blessings of God. We get the confirmation. We get the blessings spoken over our lives. And the time we hit that door, the winds come back through. And now it's, oh, Lord, I'm scared again. And Jesus is saying, I just, I, okay. Peter was doing good until he allowed what he saw. Remember, faith is the evidence of things not so he let what he saw weaken his faith. He took the focus off Jesus, y'all. And he shifted it towards the winds again. Because keep in mind, the storm never stopped throughout this entire story. Thus, he immediately began to sink. Now, what the Holy Spirit gave to me in this, in this particular part of the scripture is that if you're walking on water and you define the eyes of gravity and suddenly you lose sight of Jesus and you get caught up in what's going on in the world, that means you're going back into the world's physics. You're going back into the world's laws of nature. So if you're standing on the sea, the sea is kind of deep. I can't measure it completely, but some would tell me, my logic told me that, well, Peter should have just went straight down. But they said he sank. So he still had a little faith, but it was, it was, he was sinking. Can you imagine yourself? I think that's a miracle in itself, too. How can you walk on the sea and then just sink a little bit? Just enough so Jesus to catch you. That's still a miracle, y'all. That's the doubt. He just had doubt in his faith. But that's what doubt does. It weakens your faith to do the impossible in Jesus' name while also recreating that distance between you and God. Now, we've all been in this place where Jesus walked through our lives. We must always be diligent in keeping our eyes focused on him. Satan is waiting, waiting for that split second for you to take. All, all Satan needs is that little where you looking at God and then the wind comes and you and that's all Satan needs. Got you, got him. No, keep your mind focused on God, especially when doubt comes to play. Don't let Satan plant that lie. That's what he does. He just flicks a little seed in there of, you know, you've done too much to be forgiven. When you take your focus off Jesus and you look at the winds and what's going on in the world, and that's what Satan comes in and says, you know, you proclaim yourself to be a follower. You're supposed to be holy in, in Jesus' name and praising him and look at you now because you sunk a little bit. And that's what we do on the boat. When we see people sinking, we don't want to pull them up. You know, all the disciples, all his brothers, everybody that loved Peter, nobody hopped out there when he started sinking. It was Jesus. And that's what both people do when you have that doubt sometimes. So you have to remember to keep focus on God and don't let that doubt consume you. Now, it's going to happen. But look at what Peter did when it did happen. He cried out. He didn't say, Simon, come get me. He didn't say, Judas, I'm sinking. He said, Jesus, save me. So when you have doubt, don't feel like because you have doubt that God doesn't still love you, that God didn't still want you in his life, that God doesn't want you to spend an eternity with him in heaven. When you start to sink, cry out. Crying is not in this sense the tears, but just to cry out, to yell out, save me. Yes, Jesus has done it time and time again. That's why he came down here and died for us. He knew we were going to sink, which is why he didn't allow Peter to just into the water. He gave him a little time, a little buoyancy, so that as he sunk, he didn't go all the way down. And isn't that, everybody that's here represents that sinking, because if you had sunk completely, you would not be here. Jesus gives us that little bit of time with our faith. So Jesus' walk, as we come to a close, 
It didn't stop on the water, y'all. My Bible tells me that he saved Peter from sinking, and they continued to walk on the water towards the boat. And what I see here now, we talked about the walk is our lifestyle. The storms are the atmosphere of the world that we live in, and the boat is the world. So let's see here. You, you're scared. You get faith through the word of God. You have doubts, but Jesus still picks you up. And once you get that faith back, you're going back into the world. As Christians, that's what we do. Once you get your faith up and keep it up by standing the word of God, now you can go back to the boat with confidence. And now the people in the boat have seen the things that God has done for you in your life. And now you are a testimony to the people of the boat. And now maybe some more people can come out the boat and walk with Jesus and then come back and go back to the boat and get some more people out of the world and walk with Jesus and then come back to the boat and get some more people out of the world and go walk with Jesus and it keeps going and going until the boat is empty and everybody's in the water walking on faith. Even after that experience, Jesus continued to show his love for me, for you, for everyone when he took another walk. That walk was towards Calvary. This time, he walked with a cross so heavy, they had to let a brother named Simon, a black man, from the city of Serene, which of those of you who don't know what Serene is, it's in Libya. And if you don't know what Libya is, Libya is in Africa. They had this brother carry the cross and walk with Jesus. Remember, walking is how you carry yourself. Jesus willingly let them nail him between two thieves. Jesus kept on walking. They stripped him naked. The pictures don't do it justice. Jesus was naked. And he kept walking. He hung. He bled. And he died. And he didn't stop walking. He, he carried himself even further past death, and rose up again on the third day. He conquered death, and he conquered fear. So I wouldn't have to be fearful. He spoke life into me. So I would have water-walking faith. I was doubting him, despite everything he's done in my life. Everything that he does in your life. He spared your life. He spared your children's lives. He spared your co-workers' lives. He kept you out of hurt, harm, and danger that you don't even knew, you didn't know was happening. And you still doubted him. Everything he's done for you, you still doubted him. Despite all he has done. And I was sinking. But he kept walking. Until he saved me. Where are you when he's walking in your life? Are you scared in fear? Are you walking in faith? Are you sinking in doubt? No matter where you are in that storm, Jesus is still walking through you. And, you, and this is the last point before I take my seat. Throughout this entire passage, the storm never stopped. And what the Holy Spirit gave to me is that you, we need to stop. I need to stop. Begging God to take away the storm that he put in place to get me closer to him. Why, why would I want, if I want to get close to God and God sends a storm, Lord, just please take this away. Just remove this in Jesus' name. I just declare and decree that it's just going to be moved. And God's saying to you, I put that there because if I hadn't put it there, you wouldn't be talking to me right now. Stop asking God to take the storm away and have him give you the strength and get the faith. Listen to the word of God so that you can move through the storm because you do have to go back to that boat and get some more people. Where were you when he was walking? I can say that I was sinking deep. Deep. Peter, I, I imagine Peter may have got waist deep, but I, was, I had a pinky hanging out the water. Sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore. 
very deeply stained within, sinking, sinking to rise no more. But the master, the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Master, save me. From the waters, he lifted me. And now safe, not fearful, safe. Not doubtful, safe. Not worried, safe. Not in the boat, but still safe in the water. Safe am I. Where are you when Jesus is walking? God bless you. And may he keep you is my prayer. At this time, the doors of the church is open. You know, Ty Tribbett sings a song called Sinking. And he, and he testifies in that song that a lot of people are sinking. They look good, but you're sinking. Preachers are preaching and sinking. Musicians are playing and sinking. You're smiling and people think you got life going on and you're sinking. God has done so much for you and you're still doubting and you're still sinking. But it's okay. Jesus scolded Peter and said, oh, you have little faith. Not none. Yeah, a little bit. I didn't let you perish because I love you. Today, God doesn't want you to perish. He's here to catch you from sinking. According to the world, you should have went straight into the water. But Jesus keeps you with his right hand. If you're tired of sinking, this is an opportunity to come back to Jesus. This is your time. Jesus, I want to walk on water. When the Spirit gave me this message, it was a, everybody talks about Jesus walking on water. It's a miracle. How is that a miracle? That's Jesus. He can do anything. But old broke down, cussing, fighting Peter was walking. And that was the miracle. You are the miracle. All you got to do is come to him. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus just now. Oh, come to Jesus, come to Jesus just now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you. Save you just now. Oh, he will save you. He will save you just only trust him. Only trust. He won't let you sink completely. He won't let you go down for the count. If you just trust him. I know he will because he saved me. I was sinking badly. But I trusted him. It is ours to offer. It is yours to accept or reject. God bless you.